democracy and government department. Uh, this is an event which is online here in uh, this theatre, but also uh, being broadcast sorry, it's here in person and available online, get it the right way around. And what we're here to do this evening is to hear a lecture from, indeed, welcome to the school, uh, one of the key officers of the United Kingdom Parliament. At a time of great challenge to liberal democracy. I'm not to go too deep into this evening, but here we are in the UK with a long evolved parliamentary system, thousand years of evolution, when in a number of countries around the world, trust in democracy has fallen, the way these institutions function is changing, radical elections happen again and again, another one today in the further part of the world in Argentina, things are changing in countries around the world. So it's good to have an opportunity to consider the, the composition, the size, the activities of and potential reform of the UK Parliament's upper house. The UK Parliament has two chambers, House of Commons, the House of Lords. And Lords reform, given I don't want to steal any of our speakers' thunder, um, is a subject that academics in particular love to discuss, but people in political parties, and indeed the Lords itself has considered, the House of Lords itself has considered this issue. And of course, the House of Lords is a part of the UK's sovereign parliament. And indeed, it's the basis of today's parliament, the evolved history of the institutions. Remembering those of you who remember Magna Carta uh, and um, King John and all of that, the way in which this system has evolved and the Commons as the now the elected House, uh, in addition to the Lords, is part of this extraordinary thousand year long evolution and without actually uh, aiming off for King Charles I, the glorious revolution, not revolutions at least since the Enlightenment. So uh, it's an extraordinary thing to consider the House of Lords in a country like the UK with its long evolved system and indeed no written constitution. So a number of things that makes the UK unusual and different and having the Lord Speaker here this evening is a great privilege. Now I'll just say a few words about the Lord Speaker and then pass you over to him. There'll be an opportunity as ever to hear uh, the Lord Speaker's speech and at the end of that uh, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A, questions and answers within the room and indeed for those of you uh, at home and elsewhere online around the world. Now uh, Lord McFall, John McFall, was Labour MP for Dumbarton and later West Dumbartonshire between uh, 1987 and 2010. He served as a minister in the Northern Ireland office and as a government whip. Between 2001 and 2010, he was chair of the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee. I think it's worth saying that in that role and others beyond that, has become a great champion of consumer rights and indeed, I think, as a visiting professor at the University of Strathclyde as well. Um, he was awarded a life period in 2010, and Lord McFall was senior deputy speaker in the Lords from 2016 to 2021, and elected Lord Speaker in 2021. So it gives me very great pleasure on behalf of the LSE community and everybody else here this evening to welcome the Lord Speaker, Lord McFall. Thank you very much, Tony, for that kind introduction. It's not always I get a kind introduction, especially as an MP for 23 years. <laughs> Sometimes we get things thrown at us, but I know I'm in safe ground tonight. But it is a privilege to, to speak at a university with such a proud tradition of learning and innovation. And my respect for the London School of Economics is in part inspired by the work of William Beveridge, who was your director and authored the eponymous report which built consensus on the role of the state in post-war Britain. Although I left school early, I qualified through adult education, entered teaching, and was a head, deputy headmaster when I was diverted into my political career. I have never lost my passion for learning, and I want to use this evening's talk to explore how the House of Lords addresses some of the most pressing problems of our era by learning, by reaching conclusions 
based on facts and objective analysis, and by using what it had learned to build consensus. If your understanding of politics is based on media representations of Parliament, you may be surprised to hear the words learning and objectivity mentioned in the same breath as the House of Lords. A quick flick through recent clippings finds headlines like The Lords Have Got To Go, Absurd Aristocrats and Cronies Lording Over All Of Us. Media coverage focuses heavily on controversy around appointments and individual members' alleged misdemeanours, and commentators regularly trot out demands for abolition as if this could be achieved with no loss to our system of government. But there is little or no reporting <coughs> of the work which is actually done in the Lords, and little analysis of whether radical reforms such as the election of members would improve the way law is made in our country. I have sympathy for the calls of changes in structure and in culture. And in my non-party role as Lord Speaker, I cannot campaign for a particular reform agenda. But I believe that anyone wishing to sweep away the existing system must take a long, hard look at what the House of Lords does and answer the question of whether its work could be replicated under an alternative framework. Looking firstly at the work of the Second Chamber, I believe that the House of Lords makes three distinctive contributions to the political process. First, we debate extensively the really important issues. Second, we bring genuine expertise to bear. And third, we conduct ourselves with respect for all. What are the really important issues that Parliament needs to discuss? You could probably reel off a list. Climate change, economic instability, migratory pressures, new technology. I think many of them can be boiled down to what I call the four Ds. Demographics, data, decentralisation and disorder. Demographics. Our population is getting older. That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> but it means, particularly for me, uh, but it means increased demand for pensions, health care and social care. It means an increased burden on a smaller workforce of younger people who find themselves excluded from the access to housing, early retirement and generous pensions that were available to their parents' generation. Data. The internet has been predominantly a force for good in our economies and in social connection, and AI promises further benefits. But both also bring big challenges, whether threats to jobs, mental stress caused by social media, loss of privacy and security, or fake news undermining trust. New technologies have fuelled the emergence of the three Ps in politics. Populism, post-truth and polarisation. Decentralisation. People rightly expect more say in their lives and our centralised system faces pressure for the devolution of political, economic and social power. While the rising cost of living in our capital has made it more attractive for many young people to build their lives and careers elsewhere. London still holds sway over much decision making for other parts of the United Kingdom. In disorder, over the last 30 years, many of the anchor points that ordered the world of the late 20th century have been uprooted. The market economy has struggled to deliver prosperity since the financial crisis of 2007. Capitalism is no longer seen universally as the ri rising tide that lifts all boats. The basic necessities of life have become unaffordable for many. 
Recent years have witnessed a retreat from globalisation, a return to protectionist policies and the re-emergence of armed aggression in Europe and now conflict in the Middle East. We have moved from a bipolar world order to a multipolar world with the rise of the global east and the global south. Tomorrow, we welcome to Parliament the President of the Republic of Korea, a prime example of a state which has undergone a transformation from poverty to economic power and influence in a few short decades. These four clusters of challenges, the four Ds, are shaping the world our young people will live in. Their complexity means we need a learning approach, constantly assembling and analysing new information to construct an understanding of a world in flux. And we need an engaging approach, bringing people together to build consensus for action. These are approaches taken in the House of Lords, which brings together some of our nation's finest minds to consider the thorniest issues away from the front line of political battle, with the aim of reaching conclusions which can command consensus. Foremost in this endeavour are our committees. For example, the Economic Affairs Committee recently reported on the impact of demographics, COVID and retirement trends in the UK workforce under the title, Where Have All the Workers Gone? It is now conducting a thematic inquiry into the Bank of England, asking whether the goals and tools it was handed when made independent 25 years ago remain appropriate in today's world of inflation volatility. Other committees have investigated how government can ensure a resilient and affordable energy supply during the transition to net zero, or how we can draw up new rules to govern the use of AI in warfare, because we don't have that at the moment. The Lords also plays a crucial role in what many would see as Parliament's most fundamental attack, a task, setting down the law of the land, largely away from the spotlight of publicity, the Second Chamber works doggedly on the exacting task of scrutiny and revision to ensure that legislation works as intended. Bills frequently arrive in the Lords in an incomplete state, with important detail yet to be filled in. The time for debate in the Commons is closely controlled by the Government. MPs receive strict instructions from whips on how they should vote, with much of their day now taken up by constituency work, campaigning and the demands of 24-hour media and social media, many have little time for close examination of legislation. It is when a bill is in the Lords that the real job of line-by-line -line scrutiny happens. Unlike the Commons, we have no guillotine on debate and no selection of amendments. Discussions continue for as long as it takes and no aspect of legislation is too obscure to be examined. There is no overall party majority, so ministers must proceed by persuasion rather than the force of numbers. This scrutiny has a real effect on the laws which are passed by Parliament. In a typical year, there are more than 1,000 amendments made to government legislation in the Lords. In fact, there were more than 2,500 in the session just ended. About 100 of these each year are the result of government defeats in Lords' votes. These upsets grab most of the media headlines, despite the fact that many of them are subsequently overturned in the Commons. But a greater impact is arguably made by the thousands of amendments which are passed with government approval, many of which represent a minister listening to concerns and objectives, objections raised by peers and revising plans in response. It is this way 
that the House of Lords deploys its independence and expertise to address the most important long-term issues facing the UK and building consensus around the way forward. In his recent book, How Westminster Works and Why It Doesn't, political commentator Ian Dunn describes the Lords as, and I quote, one of the only aspects of our constitutional arrangements that actually works. And he states that it is the independence and expertise of the Second Chamber that makes it so effective. What do we mean by independence? No party has a majority in the House of Lords, and a quarter of members, 180, are non-party crossbenchers or non-affiliated peers. Even members belonging to a political party have a measure of independence because they're generally not seeking promotion. These facts combine to make the House a forum for independent thought by those who have already achieved distinction in their careers. The Red Benches are home to eminent figures from all corners of the UK's public life. Scientists, doctors, captains of industry and leaders of trade unions, campaigners for civil liberties and disability rights, environmentalists, academics and engineers. Their presence is a reflection of the fact that the life of the nation does not reside only in political parties, but is also expressed through institutions and organisations of many kinds. The diversity feeds into the expertise of the House. The Lords offers a powerhouse of knowledge and experience that any private consultancy would charge huge sums to access. The Economic Affairs Committee, most former Bank of England Governor Mervyn King, ex-Cabinet Minister Helen Liddell and Treasury Permanent Secretary Andrew Turnbull. The European Affairs Committee is chaired by former National Security Advisor Peter Ricketts and includes David Haney, once the UK's permanent representative at the United Nations, and former MI5 Chief Eliza Manningham Buller has been an active member of committees on security and technology. <clears throat> Some suggest that ministers get an easy ride in the House of Lords. Well, let me tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. One former minister who served in both houses told me the experience of being questioned by peers is much more daunting. In the Lords, grillings are administered by former Secretaries of State and leaders of the civil service, judges, ambassadors, European commissioners, ex-heads of bodies like NATO or the Joint Intelligence Committee. These are people who know their subjects intimately and can cut straight through to the nub of any issue. The House of Lords has been described by constitutional expert Professor Philip Norton as, quote, an error, an arena for the discourse of civil society. Its ability to draw on the talents of those at the pinnacle of so many spheres of human activity is a precious outcome and resource which should not be squandered. When I say these words, I am forcefully reminded of the example of my dear friend and colleague, Eager Judge, the former Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, who sadly passed away a few weeks ago. Until earlier this year, Lord Judge was a constant presence in the House, diligently, diligently examining the detailed wording of bills and drafting crucial revisions where, which were accepted by the government as improvements to the law. Another aspect of the Second Chamber which should not be diminished is the civility of its proceedings. Voters whose only exposure to Parliament comes from TV coverage of Prime Minister's questions might be forgiven for thinking that Westminster is a rowdy place characterised by point scoring, put downs and fractious disagreements. They would be surprised to learn <coughs> that the House of Lords rarely hears a raised voice. We pride ourselves in conducting a courteous conversation, allowing members to disagree agreeably. 
I believe that this provides a pattern for respectful and reasoned debate in a public square increasingly dominated by tit-for-tat slanging matches. This brings me to the question of reform. Now, I freely acknowledge that we would never create an upper chamber this way <coughs> if we were starting from scratch, but we are not starting from scratch. And history shows that progress can be made by improving on existing structures, while wholesale change must be treated with caution. We have twice made significant but incremental reforms to the composition of the House. The introduction of life peerages in 1958 revived what had been seen as a moribund assembly, adding individuals with extraordinary capabilities and experiences. And the removal of almost all hereditaries in 1999 gave peers further authority to challenge government legislation. In contrast, attempts at radical overhauls have run into the sand. The Labour administration of 1968 <coughs> attempted to introduce a permanent government majority in the Upper House. In 2012, the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition tried to create an 80% elected House with 15-year terms. <coughs> they failed because they lacked consensus and clarity about the nature of proposed new arrangements. More recently, the prospect of an elected House of Lords or Senate has again been revived. But I know that the same questions will come back. What powers will the new chamber have? And how will differences with the Commons be resolved? <coughs> As things stand, the elected House rightly exercises primacy within Parliament. Peers regularly ask the Commons to think again on legislation. But the elected House has the final say, and the process almost never ends in gridlock. Would a partially or wholly elected upper house be so ready to accept the will of MPs? Would an elected upper house attract members with the experience, expertise and independence of the Lords? Would its members be ready to undertake the painstaking work of scrutiny and revision, which acts as an essential check and balance on the elected majority? While I defend the role of the House of Lords, I believe it's also clear that reforms are needed. Not reforms of our powers or procedures, but reforms to our size, composition and appointment. Both my predecessor, Norman Fowler, and I have been at the centre of advocacy for incremental reforms of the House, and we have found that the majority of members share our appetite for change, but successive governments have shown limited interest. I fully support recommendations put forward by the Burns Committee in 2017, which would reduce the size of the House to 600. But recent Prime Ministers have sometimes been profligate with appointment when we should be operating a two-out, one-in basis. I've also welcomed debate on reforms to the appointment system proposed by members of the Lords. These include an end to the award of peerages and resignation honours lists, allowing numbers of hereditary peers to fall by ending the system of by-elections to fill empty places, and increasing the power of the Independent House of Lords Appointments Commission to vet Prime Ministerial nominees for merit and readiness to take part in the work of the House. One of the strengths of the UK Constitution is that it has been able to evolve to meet new external and internal challenges. Now is a time for evolutionary change. I have spelled out some of the challenges which I believe our political system faces. I do not claim to have the answers to these challenges. Indeed, I believe that many of the problems can only be made worse by politicians 
pretending to have quick solutions. However, my experience as Chairman of the Commons Treasury Committee and a member of the Committee and Commission on the Future of Banking, which I established following the financial crisis, taught me the value of certain principles. And what are these? First, civic engagement. To get the broadest possible range of opinion and insight to inform our proposals for the future of banking, we spoke to not only politicians and advisors, but to bankers, external economists and consumers. Next, a long-term perspective. We need solutions which would last and be flexible enough to respond to developments in a rapidly changing industry. And last, the consensual working. As a Labour MP at the time, I had a deliberate policy of reaching out across the party divide to involve senior members of the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats and ensure our proposals had broad-based support which would survive, survive changes in government. Often the obstacle to addressing complex issues is the difficulty we have in working productively together. On too many key issues, we all know the broad direction of travel, but we fail to unite behind taking the necessary steps. Yet these are the core tasks of politics and politicians. We need collaboration, shared learning and action at all levels. My concern is that a political system driven by five-year electoral cycles and regular reshuffling of ministers can mean that politicians are rewarded for novelty and the appearance of activity rather than the policy stability that delivers long-term gains. The party battle can mean that the work of finding agreement on long-term goals takes second place to the search for wedge issues, which may deliver a momentary advantage over your rivals. There is a place for the contest between the parties, which characterises the elected House of Commons. But there is also a place for the consensus-driven approach often seen in the Lords. This builds the kind of trust which permits open-minded analysis of the choices ahead of us and improves the chance of agreement on the best course of action. Isn't this a process of education in the broadest sense of the word? In our increasingly fractured society, we need to learn again how to get along despite our differences. Indeed, we need to learn how to prosper from our differences. I think again of Lord Judge, who instead of disparaging opinions which diverged from his own, <coughs> would say, how interesting that you take a different point of view on this issue. <coughs> Let's explore how that comes about and what possibilities arise. And my conclusion is that the challenges facing us are complex and it is incumbent on us as politicians to consider not only what we need to do, but how we should go about the task. Our approach must involve engaging civil society so that we learn from devolved and local government businesses, workers, academics, charities and community organisations. Secondly, taking a long-term perspective, developing programmes that can evolve as technological and demographic change works through. And thirdly, shifting our political culture so politicians feel they will be rewarded at the ballot box for tackling the big issues in a sober and meticulous way. Now, none of this will happen unless we build trust and mobilise consent. What are the key tools for this task? I see a few possibilities, but I'm sure you can add to the list. Some are structural, for example, reforming the House of Lords to boost the credibility of the part it can play. Increasing the outreach from Parliament to civil society, as Ireland has done with civil assemblies, citizens' assemblies, 
and making greater use of consultation and pre-legislative scrutiny, pre scrutiny to ensure bills are fit for purpose. And more post-legislative scrutiny of the kind the Lords undertakes when it looks back at an act several years after it has become law to see whether it has had the intended effect. In the new session of Parliament, which has just begun, we are establishing two special inquiry committees, which don't exist in the Commons, to investigate how the Inquiries Act 2005 and the Modern Slavery Act 2015 have worked out in practice. Other potential changes are cultural. This could <coughs> involve nurturing inter-parliamentary links and mutual respect between Westminster and the devolved assemblies. One of my first acts as Lord Speaker was to visit Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast and establish an inter-parliamentary forum in which the devolved institutions meet and speak with the Commons and Lords on an equal footing. No exceptionalism for Westminster. It could mean creating a common narrative which resonates with everyone. Beveridge famously did this in the 1940s when he listed the five giants to be tackled by the post-war welfare state. Want, disease, ignorance, squalor and idleness. The threats may be different today, but who can doubt that we face modern giants in the 21st century? <coughs> It probably doesn't surprise you that the Lord Speaker thinks the House of Lords plays a vital role in our Constitution, addressing our most complex issues, exploring with objectivity and building consensus. As I've tried to set out in this speech, I believe the mission of the Lords is informed by the same values of education that the LSE exemplifies a spirit of curiosity and an openness to new ideas, an appetite to seek out evidence and to interrogate it rigorously before coming to conclusions, and a respect for learning and expertise as a route to understanding our modern world. These are values which have served both our Parliament and our universities well over the centuries. I believe they can continue to be deployed by the House of Lords as it plays its part as a second chamber in helping our nation overcome the formidable challenges which lie ahead. Thank you. Okay, well, first, uh, thank you for a not an elegant tour of the horizon of not just the House of Lords' considerations and your considerations about its future, but also the broader challenges that democracy in this country, government in many countries face. Just one, to add to one thing, one point you made earlier, which I'm sure everybody in the room knows this, but I think it's an interesting difference between the Commons and the Lords, which is that the House of Lords has cross benches. Now, you are a party politician before you went into the Lords. Norman Fowley, your predecessor, was a conservative, senior dis and distinguished conservative politician. But the Lords has, and I think a lot of the ex-diplomats and others that you mentioned, would actually not take the party whip. They'd sit as crossbenchers. Can you say a little bit about how that affects the dynamics, given that you were in the Lords, you're in the Lords now in its chair, effectively, but were in the Commons for many years as well? Yeah. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, the number of crossbenchers in the Lords is about 180. What does that mean? It means that no legislation uh, in the Lords uh, can successfully get gets passed or any votes without the crossbenchers. So that's the first thing, and that's what's different from the House of Commons. Uh, the composition of the, the Lords is different from the House of Commons. And if you like, the House of Lords uh, is complementary to the work of the House of Commons. And I think 
those are the biggest uh, issues with mm. cross benchers. But cross benchers bring wide experience. I, I, I'll give an example. When we were discussing Brexit and European issue, Article 51 came up. You remember that infamous article? You know, when do we tell uh, Europe to go, to get lost? Right. So we were debating it in the House, and someone was waxing away about Article 51. And then Lord Kerr of Kinlochart, our man in Europe, stood up and he said, I can tell you about Article 51. He said, because I wrote it. <laughs> and he says, and by the way, he says, I wrote it with this pen. <laughs> so that's what you call experience. Yeah. And he's a crossbencher, and that's what crossbenchers bring. Building on that, you, you mentioned the civility. Now, actually, I mean, the House, I was thinking, you're, you're, I take your point about the House of Commons. Many of us, many people around the world watch you know, Prime Minister's Question Time and sort of build their view of the House of Commons on the basis of that. But as we know, and we all know, actually, most of what MPs do is not like that. But actually, even the House of Commons, in some way, these days, is less confrontational, less likely to... to you know, dip into the complex world that's fought out on Twitter or X every day. And this, the, the House of Lords is even more reasoned, and indeed, so my question is, is it sort of, and forgive the pun here, peer pressure? That is, thank you, when you're in the House of Lords, when one becomes a member of the House of Lords, in a sense you in, enter an institution where a particular way of behaving and discussing things and arguing politely or in a way that isn't deliberately aggressive simply becomes the thing that helps you get through the system and have any influence? Well, I was an MP for 23 years, as you know, and I was happy to take part in the ideological debates. Mm. In fact, Michael Forsyth, who's Secretary of State for Scotland, and him and I shared the boundary uh, in Loch Lomond. So right down the middle of Loch Lomond, beautiful place, uh, I represented the west bank of it, and Michael Forsyth represented the east bank. And somebody mentioned one day when they came to my constituency, John, you can see in the middle of Loch Lomond, it's pretty turbulent. I put it down to the fact that you're on one side, Forsyth is on the other side. So there is a keen uh, ideological debate there. My friends were saying to me when I stood down in 2010, uh, don't go into the House of Lords because it's different, it's boring. Uh, and it, you've lived 23 years in the House of Commons and you'll not get any satisfaction out of it. <clears throat> but I went in all the list. Gordon Brown asked me to go in, uh, given the 10 years I had as chair of the Treasury Committee in Economics and Finance. And I undertook a psychological change. In other words, my voice wasn't as strong as it was in the House of Commons. And if you like, in the House of Commons, I gave my opinion, irrespective of what somebody wanted. But in the House of Lords, I was asked for my opinion. And it's that gentle change that's there. And if you can accept that, it's very important. I mentioned that Gordon Brown put me in. Uh, a couple of years after that, uh, the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards was established, David um, Cameron. Now, how was that established? I mentioned in my speech about the future of Banking Commission. When I was chairman of the Treasury Committee, <clears throat> I was very keen that civic society's voice hadn't been heard. But I, I wanted to set up a committee, but I didn't want to chair it because I had the uh, political role on it. So, example of reaching out, I spoke to David Davis. I said, David, will you chair this? Uh, and then Vince Cable, I said, Vince, will you come on it? Uh, we got them, but we also got experts in finance and uh, other areas. In fact, we had a Benedict Monk who was an advisor in ethics. And he was the most troubling of all. <laughs> but uh, what that did is that given my position, I was able to invite people of authority, you know, like the governor and, and other individuals. And we made a report 
you know, based on the civic engagement. That uh, led to it being given to David Cameron just before the election. And as a result of that, the Vickers Commission was established. Uh, then the uh, Parliamentary Commission for Banking Standards was established. And that, from the House of Lords, had Nigel Lawson, dearly departed. Uh, we had the Archbishop of Canterbury and we had David uh, Turnbull, Andrew Turnbull, on it. There were members from the House of Commons, and I well remember the chair, Andrew Tyree, writing to me at the time. He says, John, we have not been able to get some of the legislation accepted by the House of Commons. It's up to yourselves. Well, with that, Nigel Austin, others ourselves, we got the amendments passed because we have no guillotine. Yeah. So we could uh, discuss things for quite a long time. So it was that consensual approach with the House of Lords and the House of Commons that delivered that, and that changed legislation uh, as a result of it. So that was civic action uh, working. Great. OK, enough from me here now. Um, questions from the audience? I'll take one in the middle there and then one here. I'll take three. In fact, I'll take one gentleman behind you and then here, and I'll come over here. So, yes, there. Is then that if you'd like to say who you are, yes. feel free and where you come from, but don't feel you've got to. I'm Hattie Simpson. I'm an A-level student from Hertfordshire. Uh, a lot of the benefits you've discussed of the House of Lords could largely be, largely be explained by the lack of reform of the House of Commons. To what extent is there an argument for actual radical reform of the House of Lords, but for that to succeed, radical reform of the House of Commons and the electoral system first? Okay, so that, just to check I've got the question, that the, the, it says the question of Lord's reform hangs on the Commons' own reform and that that would be a pre, almost a predeterminant of the Lord's capacity to reform. Okay, great question. Gentleman uh, behind. Rajan Kumar. Um, uh, David Cameron, uh, Lord Cameron, is going to be performing his role of this great office of state from the House of Lords. Um, what are your thoughts on that, given that it's an unusual occurrence, and how he can perform that role effectively and be scrutinised effectively from that chamber? Yes, in, in history, having members, and Lord Salisbury, of course, was Prime Minister in the House of Lords, yep, but I think yep. it was the last person who was, but it's, it's a great question. And, and oh, well, I'll take the two of you. No, and you as well. I'll take the two of you. Go on. Uh, hi, I'm Desi, I'm a first year law student. Um, I think you mentioned in your speech, if we were to come up with a structure of parliament today, that there wouldn't be a House of Lords. Um, I guess what would have happened alternatively? Okay, so again, so the, the question sort of being is, yes, well, I'll, you, it's a clear question, why should I repeat it? Very good, and the guy in front. Hi, um, Sixto from Argentina. It's quite similar to the other questions. Uh, what changes would you like to see in the House of Lords? Changes, okay. Defense. What changes Defense. would you like to see in your country after today? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a new dawn, as somebody yeah. once said. Good, okay. Right, okay, first one, the uh, parliamentary focus. I believe our whole system needs to be looked at. I believe the House of Lords uh, obviously, it needs that. Example of the House of Lords, uh, our appointments pr uh, process. I mentioned with cross benchers and independent members, uh, when Tony Blair established the House of Lords Appointments Commission in 2000, he suggested 10 or 12 uh, independent people to be, uh, uh, you know, to be accepted in the House of Lords. David Cameron, for whatever reason, in 2010 or 2012, asked the House of Lords Appointments Commission to limit it to two, with the result that in the first 12 years, uh, there were 59 peers uh, appointed, but in the next 12 years up to now, uh, there are 15. And that means there's a deficit in experience as, as we go on. So that's the first thing I would do. And I'd put the House of Lords Appointments Commission uh, or I would rather, as Lord Speaker, I can do anything, but I would suggest a good debate on the House of Lords Appointments Commission being a statutory body 
and being independent. Secondly, the hereditary peers. If we're going to reduce the size of the House of Lords, the hereditary peers stand out in that their numbers will never uh, go lower because we've got by-elections there. So it will remain static, and that has to be treated like others. So therefore, looking at the abolition of by-elections for hereditary peers, uh, I think is something worthwhile. Because you get, if you like, the ludicrous situation where you have a contest for elected peers, and it would have a constituency of three voting members. You know, right? So something like that uh, has to go. So that's just for starters with those points uh, on that. So coming from Scotland, I'm very much aware of the debate on devolution. And in fact, I was on the Scottish front bench in opposition in the 1990s when we had the constitution and campaign for the Scottish Parliament on that. And I'm also very conscious that the House of Lords is seen as a South East institution. It isn't seen for the whole of the United Kingdom. And that was why my first act as Lord Speaker was to visit Belfast, Edinburgh and Cardiff. <coughs> and the inter-parliamentary forum we have at the moment is a springboard for further engagement, engaging each other eye to eye. To give you an example, uh, Tony mentioned I was in Northern Ireland for a while. But before that, I was on the British Irish Parliamentary Body, which was established in the 1980s. And what did we do in the British Irish Parliamentary Body? We had a good chat with each other. We looked at things, at informal negotiations. We had a good pint of Guinness at night. But maybe there wasn't really much more than that. But then came the Good Friday Agreement, and we knew each other. And that was a huge issue. For example, when we went across, Jerry Adams and Mark McGuinness, their voices weren't allowed to be broadcast uh, anywhere, the news, whatever else. So we had actors doing that. That went, we, no minister was allowed to shake hands with them. Then we got to the stage where they would meet but they would be in the same room, but they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't meet, they wouldn't talk to each other. Now, I'm not putting any blame in that in MD, but you'd have somebody who was a chair and say, you had David Trimble at one bit, and David Trimble said something. So you as chair would say, Jerry, David Trimble said this. So Jerry would speak, and then we'd turn around and say, David, Jerry said that, right? That moved on. And it moved on to the extent that they, they formed the assembly. And it moved further that when Ian Paisley uh, became first minister and Mark McGuinness uh, was elected to the same position, they ended up by being known as the Chuckle Brothers. They laughed with each other. Right, now that was a huge uh, change in it. And it came about, in my opinion, because over decades we met each other, uh, we saw each other in the flesh, we engaged in particular issues. And only two weeks ago, I had the Speaker of the Upper Parliament in, in Dublin, and he got a great reception. And uh, Jan and others, and Susie, you know, helped get that organised, but he couldn't have gone away happier as a result of that. But just think about it. The British state, in my guise, invited the Speaker of the Upper House in Ireland to the King's speech. How about that, folks? There you are. And that's what you call engagement. So that's very important. So that's the consensual aspect in taking things forward, Tony. And having and, a senior member in the House of Lords, <clears throat> I mean a member, of, sorry, a member of the Cabinet, in the House of Lords, yep. with this, uh, this sort of, you know, the, the, I know you can't comment on an individual appointment, but as a principle, and I, I think Labour did, Labour probably did the same, I can't remember now, anyway. But yeah, what, what, what you got to Well, uh, Peter Manson was the Mandelson, European yeah, was Commissioner, Manson, right. Yeah. Uh, that, Lord Carrington uh, was Lord Foreign Carrington. Secretary uh, when he was in. In fact, David Cameron was introduced today, and as Lord Speaker, I have to welcome him officially. 
So I shook his hand and I said to him, we meet again, David, we meet again. (laughs) (laughs) At which he laughed. So uh, I don't imagine it'll be, he's there for a long time, but I think it helps the status of the House of Lords. But also what we've got to remember is that House of Commons is an elected body and myself as Lord Speaker, I've got to be sensitive to the, the interests of, of the House of Commons. So I think the Speaker has asked the clerks, the seniors clerks, to look at the issues as to how they ensure accountability of the Foreign, the foreign Secretary. Andrew Mitchell is his deputy and he will answer questions, but they'll want more than that, particularly at, at, at this time. But in the House of Lords, he will answer questions on a monthly basis uh, for 30 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah, you're got it right. So that's it. So you'll be accountable to the House of Lords, but the main place should be the House of Commons. Okay. What was the question? I t- there was one question. Sorry, your question again about the Lords and if r- repeat. Oh, yeah. Yes, if we were starting from, I mean, I think you said yourself, nobody would really, none oh, of us would no, start no. from here. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things in the UK you wouldn't start with from here. It's true of most countries, but at a risk of, you know, going all the way through the debate but again, how it might be reformed, if you were starting a new country, how might you do it? And it's a big question, but, you know, how would you, would you advise them on having a second chamber? That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Start a new country. Well, the Scottish Parliament. Scottish Parliament. Right, OK. Uh, the Scottish Parliament get elected. And it was on a proportional basis that, yep. that the Labour government said that the, there would never be a majority. But the SNP came along in 2006 and have been there ever since as a result of it. And the Scottish Parliament uh, was stab- established on the basis that it's different from Westminster. Mm. Uh, it's consensual. And they had a horseshoe uh, approach as opposed to facing each other across the chamber. But it's the same as Westminster in many, in many ways like that. Would I advocate a second chamber? Absolutely a second chamber. And I think that will be the debate in Scotland now uh, uh, about having a, se- a second chamber as a result. But Ross Cranston was a distinguished member of parliament, legal eagle uh, on that. And the, the need for a second chamber... Uh, Ross, I think is extremely important because a lot of the legislation that we get uh, hasn't been road tested as a result of that. And uh, ministers, particularly when we were a Labour government, when they sent their legislation to the House of Lords, like David Blunkett, I interviewed him just a couple of weeks ago, he said, he said I thought it was really you know, frustrating uh, and I, I wanted to get away. Helen Little said to me, that when she was uh, in the Treasury, uh, she had a bill on energy. And she says, when it came back for the House of Lords, I knew more about energy than I did when the bill went there before. And David uh, said to me in his latest interview, the proceeds are crime. We didn't get it right. The House of Lords helped it, but uh, we could have done with more scrutiny on that. So in terms of scrutiny, the House of Lords is really important. And they, uh, Ross, you are a minister. Would you agree with that? I certainly would. And John, originally I came to... Can we get a microphone to the front? Because otherwise people on, at home, online, sorry, wherever you are, can't hear me. John, you may remember that originally I came from Queensland, Australia. Yeah. And in the 1920s, they abolished the upper house there, led the Legislative Council. The result was that in Queensland, the state had some dreadful experiences with one dominant party and no checks and balances at all. So it's necessary to have checks and balances. It's necessary, as you say, to have a house that can scrutinise what the lower house does. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And it's worth noting... Can I say just in a second, you know, will it be elected or or unelected? I think today's environment, it will be elected, uh, if you're starting Mm. it today. But I think the questions you've then got is, what about the status of the House of Commons in the House of Lords? For example, in America, I think the... Uh, Senate came after the House of Representatives. Mm. But what body is the most powerful just now? It's the Senate. So that relationship is really important. The method of election is important as well. First past the post for the House of Commons. Uh, uh, the 
other, what is it, the electoral, what do we call it? Proportional, proportional representation, there you are. Proportional representation for the House of Lords. Right. They come to different uh, views. Say Brexit. House of Commons votes for Brexit. Mm. House of Lords doesn't vote for Brexit. So these are thorny questions that really they need to be looked at. And if I could sum up the essence of my speech tonight and the strap line, it would be seek to understand. It's worth noting this, of the three countries in the world that don't have a codified, some would say, written constitution, the UK is the only one of the three that has a second chamber, interestingly. The other two are unicameral, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'll take a question online. Uh, bring the... Because uh, then we're and run out of time, but yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Kay and I'm going to be reading out some of the questions online. Um, we received quite a few questions, so in the interest of time, I'm only going to give you two. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the first one comes from Camille Jonski, who's online from Poland. And he asks, in our present time of populist challenge, do you see the tension between the principle of representation implementing policies that are favoured by voters but could be unreasonable or short-sighted, and evidence-based policy-making, implementing policies when data suggests they work, which may risk bias towards the preferences of scientific and professional elites? And if so, what is an appropriate balance between the two? Slightly meaty one for you there, um, and a nice concluding one for you is from Peter Wrightson, who's a visitor to LSE. Um, he asks, do you feel that there is a broad lack of public understanding of what the House of Lords do does and the added value it provides and what can be done to rectify this? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, online population. That's great. Right. We have a world of populism just now, uh, and I mentioned in my speech about politicians putting th things forward for quick fixes. Now, it'll be hard, particularly with social media, it will be hard to reverse that, but we must ensure, as I mentioned, that with post-truth, we must get back to truth and we must get back to evidence, and that is very important. But I can talk about uh, being a long-time member of the Labour Party, uh, I'm now non-political, but for many years in the Labour Party, uh, things were pretty tough. But you have to have conviction and see it through the conviction. And you have to be what I call as a tortoise. You keep going, you keep going, you keep going. And that resilience is really important. So getting to the evidence base is important. And our Polish friend, he's just seen uh, a transition uh, into, if you like, a more possibly evidence-based uh, approach on that. Do people have a broad understanding in the House of Lords? No, that's why I'm here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, you just think, oh, wait a minute, these guys are old guys, right? Old guys. Uh, they, uh, they go to the House of Lords, they get £340 a day, they then have the best wine, and then they go home. Best club in London, maybe even the best care home. That's the type of things that are said, right? So, uh, it's my job to go out and challenge that because as law speaker, I had the choice of standing in the corner, getting pummeled, or else going out and explaining uh, to people. And to be honest with you, what I've found uh, when I've engaged with people is that, that they are learning it. I'll give you an example. I went to St Andrews University and... Uh, it was a debate, uh, this House abolishes the House of Lords. And at the beginning, they took a poll, and I think it was something like uh, 80 to 30 for abolishing the House of Lords. Two hours later, when we spoke, it was reversed. So there you are, there's always hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we need to come to a close. It's half past seven. Um, before I just uh, you know, give you a formal vote of thanks, I just um, I'd like to make the point that it's, um, excellent, given that Parliament as a whole and the sovereignty of Parliament is much discussed, discussed in the United Kingdom, came up a great deal during the um, Brexit debate, whatever side people were on, it came up a great deal. The notion of parliamentary sovereignty is very important. It's debated and it, 
you know, it will be again in the context of the relationship between the judiciary and the legislature in terms of British constitutional theory and practice. And um, the great thing about, if I may say so, the UK version of democracy is that MPs and peers do go out and make the case uh, and um, you know, make the case for, either directly as a debate or separately by their presence, why the capacity to meet people who are involved in this system and make your case to them directly. It's a case for all elected representatives and indeed in the UK's case the Lords and for also for local government as well. So it's a, uh, I think a most important element in the way we talk about not just the normal day-to-day -day business of what politics is deciding, but secondly, how we do that. Good. So, uh, Tony, could I just yes, say, please, of the question of evidence-based, right? I remember the uh, referendum in Quebec in the 80s, I think it was, mm. right? And they voted, came out. There was debate afterwards. And then what they introduced was the Clarity Act. And understand, that trying to understand, what did we vote for? In other words, put meat in the bone as a result of that. And I mentioned our post-ledge committees, uh, when we pass our legislation or do something as monumental as we've done, having clarity on that is really, really important. And let me say to you, well, this is way in the past, but in Europe, when we're talking about Brexit, I don't know what I voted for. <laughs> and I think everybody here is in the same position, right? That's the answer to the question. Very good. Well, another advertisement for House of Lords reports, which are, without question, brilliantly informed. If you're looking for <laughs> essay material, those of you looking for essay, obviously to read it and then present your version of it. But, you know, <laughs> essay material, very much better than AI, I can tell you. Right. So, By the way, I didn't know what was voting for, just in case. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming this evening. But I'd like to thank Lord McCall. <laughs>